Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Denise Martinez and I'm the marketing director at Coproduction International, the leading provider of maquiladora, shelter and administrative services in Mexico. Today, we're presenting business continuity solutions to US tariffs on Chinese imports. Our panel of experts are going to be sharing their insights on these new tariffs and the impact they will have on your industries and products. They are also going to be giving us the recommendations on duty saving strategies. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for questions at the end. Now, I am going to introduce you to our panel of experts. Eduardo Costa is the vice president of RL Jones in San Diego, where he has been a partner since 1996. Eduardo has over 25 years of experience in international trade and has been a licensed broker since 1997. Cardia Herrera is the custom compliance manager at RL Jones related to import-export customs compliance. She has 16 years of experience as a customs license broker and an active member of various trade associations. And Veronica Contreras, VP of Sales and Marketing for Co-Production International. She has worked directly on over 50 expansion projects in the Baja California border region through the Maquiladora Shelter Program, leading projects for notable companies such as Icon Aircraft, Brown Newton, Smith's Interconnect, Conesis, Aspen Medical, Sapphire, and Totco. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenters today. Denise, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. First of all, I want to thank Denise, Veronica, and Co Production for inviting Kari and myself to this webinar. I think, uh, obviously, in, in today's times and the, when we were, when Denise introduced us as experts, I think experts might be a little bit of a vague comment right now considering what's going on and all the changes that are happening as we speak and literally as we speak the last couple of days you've seen a lot of changes uh we're talking about the trade war with china and we'll get into that as well but we're also going to include uh nafta obviously and section 232 which is the duties imposed on the imports of steel and aluminum from mexico and we'll focus on mexico for obvious reasons being that we're here on the southern border we'll discuss that and, and as we were talking a few minutes ago, as Denise was saying, the, the trade war with China, I think it's something that we all have to be very, very uh, aware of, and we have to make sure that we find opportunities. You know, there's a war going on, it, there's a lot of changes going on, but there's also opportunities, and that's what we're here to discuss. There's opportunities, and since July, there's been duties imposed on all these products, so we have to now find out how we can benefit from these, uh, these tariffs and, and ship operations to Mexico or even from China, but find other ways to do it. And there's different mechanisms that we can use and we'll discuss that with you guys and obviously open it up for questions. But before we go into China, I'd like to bring up the, the uh, section 232, which is the duties that were imposed on steel and aluminum articles from Mexico. You know, we, we think that Mexico and the US are partners, but because of anti-dumping situations, uh, the president of the Trade, Act, Trade Expansion Act of 1962, uh, impose these tariffs and what this section does, section 232 does, is allows for investigations to be faster rather than going through the normal process that could take months and years. This section allows those investigations to be done faster and obviously could benefit the companies that, that would have had major impacts. And for that, talk about a little bit more about the details that we will pass the microphone to Kai. Well, hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having us this morning. Um, so, as Lalo was saying, um, on March the 8th of 2018, the president issued a proclamation, well, two proclamations, 9704 and 9705. These two proclamations are related to the investigations or to the results of the investigations mm -hmm. under Section 232 that were issued based on national security. The products that were covered for these two items are still an aluminum, an aluminum products. Now, how have you seen these, uh, this impact or who's impacted by these um, impositions of new tariffs? Well, um, for steel, we have that it is a 25% uh, additional duty or it's a duty increase um, for all countries of origin, except for some that we have listed. 
Okay, so now we have 25%. Turkey uh, just recently announced that on August the 10th of 2018 that they would be increasing their uh, duty rate to 50%. And this was due to various conflicts that they had in Turkey. Um, economically and politically. Um, so that's why uh, they had uh, to increase the, the duty rate to 50%. Um, for, uh, we were looking at absolute quotas for some of the products that are coming in for South Korea, Brazil, and Argentina, and this is for the steel. Uh, just this morning, we received um, some of our clients that are, are importing these products that the, some of, we're noticing that some of these quotas are already to the limits. Um, so there's some, some steel that we can no longer bring in since they are in a absolute quota module, meaning that certain amount of duty of steel is allowed. And then after the, that amount is full, then we cannot import those until probably next year, uh, depending on, they're, they're separated by quarters, but uh, for some of these are uh, already uh, full until next year. Karim, what's an absolute quota? An absolute quota means uh, that the government is allowing, or their agreement between these countries and the U.S. is that they were going to bring in only certain amount of uh, products, in this case steel. So they set the, the quantities, all right? So once they set the quantities, then they'll they'll um, issue on a weekly basis. They'll issue how, what the status of the course is. So everybody's trying to beat in and put in their entries, so they're able to come in at this um, to be able to be import because absolute means once they're full, you can no longer bring them in. Okay. You either have to return them or put them in a FTZ or put them in a bonded warehouse. Other a foreign quarters, trade zone, Other right? orders allow you to import goods, and once the threshold is met then you can continue to import at a higher duty. But in the case of the steel, once you reach the quota, you cannot import anymore at all from that country. So it depends on the country. Those are listed up there. Okay. okay. Um, so for aluminum, we have that we have a 10% uh, for all origins, except for Argentina, for which we have an absolute quota. And uh, Australia is at the time being exempt from this. All countries started paying, or these proclamations became into effect on March 23rd of 2018. Now, Mexico and Canada were exempt, and they only started paying until June of, of June 1st, 2018. Now, just as a sneak peek uh, for future slides, and we we're going to talk about it more in the future. In, in the slides to come, but in regards to NAFTA, uh, just so you have a side note there, is the NAFTA 2.2 version or whatever name they're going to put it does not have include any clause on this issue. So they're going to be looking at the steel 25% and the lumen 25% from NAFTA and Canada as a separate uh, issue. So it's not going to be included in the NAFTA deal. So that's going to be separate. So you just have that in the back of your mind. Drawback. What is drawback? Drawback is the ability to, uh, if you're paying duties into the United States and for whatever reason you decide that that product, you need to export it out of the country, then uh, you're able to recover the duties that you have paid at a 99%. So these duties, the 25 and the 10% and the 50% for Turkey, if you d can demonstrate that you brought in these articles of steel aluminum and that you exported them, then you're able to recover that money. So that's the drawback portion of it. For this case and for the section 232 in the proclamation, there was a, a clause that talked about the exclusions. What are exclusions? Basically, these are documents and information that you submit to the Bureau of Industry and Security, which is the BIS, and you request, you present information for your product to demonstrate that maybe the product is not available in the United States, or it's very specific, or that there's not enough product produced here and that there are contracts uh, in the middle of this of this war so that they give you sometimes the, the exclusions. Um, so that's a way of, of, of recovering or maybe not having to pay these duties. 
Now, if you are granted an exclusion, if you go through the process of, of, of following up with, with an exclusion request, these will be retroactive, meaning like at the time that you submitted your, your, your exclusion request and they authorize it, then that, from that day on, you, will be, you could refund through a post-summary correction the duties that you have paid. So how that's long, the, the that's the exclusion process. How long does it take typically for an exclusion to to be authorized? Well, uh, it is a burden process. Uh, there are some companies that have been putting in the information and they haven't gotten it approved. We're talking about a couple of months uh, because you really have to get all the documentation ready, submitted in headquarters or, or in Washington and have strong arguments for your for your case. There's, uh, I don't have the exact number of, of exclusions that have been submitted, but there are far more exclusions submitted than the ones that have been authorized. We have a, a question from Laura. Is this raw material or items created with aluminum or and or steel? Well, basically, uh, what this section covers is, is products, it's raw material. It's raw uh, steel or raw aluminum. There's certain classification codes, and we can certainly give you the list of these items that are included. It does not include uh, manufactured goods. It mainly focuses on coils, on strips, on foil. Uh, those are the raw materials that we're looking at. Normally where it might impact our industry a little bit more is when somebody, they might import these goods into Mexico for manufacture, and when they try to return the raw material in the same condition, then they might have an issue. But if they take it to Mexico, for example, transform it into a finished product, they would be exempt. Great. So that's what we have on, on the section 232, and we can move on to. Now, here we go with China and section 301. Section 301, on June 15th, the Office of the Trade Representative announced tariffs to Chinese products, and this was pursuant to section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974. So when you hear 301 duties, it refers to that act and the section 301 in particular, and section 301, its primary focus is protecting intellectual property rights. And as you know, Trump has always, President Trump has always been very candid about his, his dissatisfaction with the way uh, China has treated uh, uh, intellectual property rights of products that were sent from the US to, to China for manufacturing. And this is where, this, is where the, 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 this whole trade war gets muddy. So how do you impose these tariffs? Well, he came up with several lists and each list was gonna be implemented and a certain day, each list had its period of comments. So the first list was announced in June, went into effect in July, list one. Uh, we'll get into this list in a few minutes, and list two in August, and list three, which is the most, so far, the one that has the most impact, went into effect a couple of weeks ago. But we're gonna talk about list one, and here, Kat is gonna mention again some of the little bit of the details, and you can see the, the exemptions to this list here. If there's any specific questions, you can, if you're, if you're not on this list, then you, you have to pay. This was list number one, go ahead. Okay, all right. So as Lala was mentioning, initially, going back a little, back in April of 2018, uh, the, this administration had announced that list one would consist of 1,300, roughly about 1,300 tariff classification codes. Uh, they did, they set it up for, for comments, or they, there was a comment period, and there was many comments received, obviously, and a lot of these items were analyzed, and so this administration decided, you know what, these are a lot of classifications that we have to uh, analyze and comments that we have to analyze, and we have to get a list out there. So they came out with the official list number one, Official list number one, from the original 1,300, they came down to 818 tariff lines being affected. So um, this, this announcement uh, was made on June 15th, as we, as we had mentioned initially. And what are the products that are covered by this Section 301? Well, these are basically the chapters. So when, we, when we classify products, we normally put the items into a specific chapter. So these are some of the chapters that are, are um, being affected by list number one. As we can see, there's some, um, there's chapters uh, 28, 
40, which may be some tires, rubbers, air, used aircrafts. Chapter 84 is a lot of has to do with machinery. Chapter 85 has to do with electrical items and so forth. So those are just some of the chapters or the headings of, of some of the HTS codes being affected. Now, it does not include that does not mean that all of the tariff lines or all the classifications from these chapters are included in, in list number one. If you would like to see list number one and number two or number three, we can certainly give you this list in an Excel format, which we have found to be very, very convenient for our clients because it's much when you look it up on the internet, it gives you a PDF format, but you can't run reports with, with, the net, with PDF. So if you need it, we can give it to you in Excel and you can sort it, filter, whatever you want to do with these lists, we can certainly have them for, for your disposition. Okay. Thank you, Kanya. So anytime. Uh, so going back to section 301 to the list number one. So the increase is a 25% duty increase that we have on, line, on these 818 line items. This, I just want to make sure that I make a very clear on this. This is a duty or additional duties on the product. So if your product was originally importing and you were paying a general duty rate of say a 3%, you would now be paying the 3.0% plus the 25% that we have for this uh, under this section 301 duty. So that's very important because I have been asked in the past, well, is this like my new rate? Well, yeah, it's your new rate plus the one that you were paying. And if your product is subject to anti-dumping, then it would be the regular rate, your anti-dumping rate, and the 25% rate, yeah. okay? So it, you, you have to add them all together uh, to be able to make uh, your calculations accurate, okay? And list number three, I'm sorry, list number one came into effect on July the 6th. This was the first impact that we, that we saw. Um, we didn't we did not see in our experience as a customs broker, we did not see many importers are from from our from our nature of, of clients uh, that were included but we certainly do know that there were some included okay we have another question go ahead for from Dan if we import components or raw materials from China through Long Beach that would be subject to the 301 tariffs and those components are transformed into NAFTA qualified products. Will the components be exempt from the 301 tariffs? Okay, so basically, yes. If your product, if you're bringing in products uh, that are either included in one, two, or three, and you're taking these items to Mexico, and there is substantial transformation in Mexico. Now you have to look at the rules of origin for your product to make sure that you qualify for labeled made in Mexico and for NAFTA purposes. So if your product, even if it has Chinese content, you can still qualify for NAFTA. And when you're coming back to the United States, then you would not be subject to the additional 25% duty because your product is, your finished good is now Mexican origin. It's not a Chinese origin. Now, if you were going to bring back that item or that component as a raw material, then at that time, you would have to pay the duties on that raw material coming back. One, one, let me add to this. Uh, if, if your raw materials are being consumed in, in Mexico and into a finished product, then you should definitely not be importing them into the U.S. in Long Beach. You should be transferring them inbound through Long Beach, through the U.S. into Mexico or via Ensenada, either way, and doing your product and coming across you never pay. If you're importing those into a finished product and then transforming them into an after product and you're taking them directly into Mexico, you can also claim drawback on some of these, on some of these uh, goods. You should not be paying duty. Now, it, there's a difference. Sometimes you import them yourself and you don't have to pay the duty. A lot of times, many of the clients, they buy Chinese origin uh, raw materials in the U.S. from distributors. And so in that case, those imports have already been made. Duties have already been paid. So you got to work with your suppliers to possibly move your raw materials inbound so that you don't have that impact. But as, as far as raw materials being consumed in Mexico, you do not have to pay duties on those, uh, the 301 duties on those. That's a great strategy. Correct. Thank you, 
All right. So as Lala was saying, just uh, to finish up this slide, drawback is allowed for these for these duties. So in case you had paid them in the past and you want to recover those duties because you're exporting the item, you can certainly uh, file a drawback. And the exclusions. If you're planning to do uh, file an exclusion for, for these products, then you need to hurry because the deadline is October the 9th to submit um, any request for exclusion. Is that for list one or for all lists? This is for list, for number, list one. number one. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then we go back to, well, we go to list number two. Remember that I had initially said that the original list one was 1300 part numbers classification codes, I'm sorry. Uh, so then we had list number one, and now we are looking at list number two. So they separate it, basically. So list number two has 279 tariff lines affected and being reviewed. Uh, these are some of the chapters that are included, chapter 27, 34. So you see that they added some, of the, some new chapters along with some of the HTS codes that were already in in the, um, ch ch I'm sorry, chapters that were already listed in list number one, okay? A day, uh, again, it's a 25% duty increase uh, that started August 23rd. And once again, this is on top of whatever duties you were already paying. So 279 tariff lines were, are being affected. Drawback allowed and exclusions are, to be submitted by December the 18th. So you have a little bit more time for, for these, but don't you need to bit, hurry. <laughs> as far as an exclusion, if you apply for an exclusion and you're granted the exclusion, basically you benefit everybody. That whole HTS gets wiped out of this list. So if you can do it by sector, you can do it by industry, but if you apply for an HTS to be excluded and, and the trade representative agrees, they'll wipe that out completely, not just for you, but for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Let me, when we're gonna go to list number three, I wanna do a little introduction about, a little bit of comments about this before it kind of goes into the details on list number three. Go ahead, change the slide. I oh, thank you, Denise. Um, list number three, obviously, is, is probably the most controversial one. It's probably the one that has caused the most uh, effect on, on importers. In our industry, we did see that it's probably the list that had the most comments against it. Congress people, trade associations, companies, consumers, everybody, because a lot of the items on this list, it's where it starts to hit you. There's 6,000 tariff items on this list. Coincidentally, when the list first came out and when it was actually published in a short period of time, certain things were curiously left off the list, like tablets, televisions. I'm wondering, and, and as an association, we all wonder if that is some strategy between the president and the Chinese government, whether to leave that as a, as a bargaining chip, we're not sure. But list number three had a few things left off by the time it was published. Um, this list, like I said, had the most uh, comments against it. And even that said, the list was pretty quickly announced and implemented and went into effect on September 24th, which was the last Monday, I believe. Um, and in talking to, to people in Washington, D.C., we've, we've already found out that there's over $240 million worth of duties since July that have been collected by the U.S. government. So the concern is list three is in. It's 10%. This duty is 10%. I'll let Kari explain that, I guess. It's 10% and it's going to 25% in, in, in January. She'll explain the detail, but my, I'm, I'm looking at it from a political standpoint. Why 10% now and 25% in January? Is they're going, are they expecting some negotiations? I understand that the Chinese government has not been willing to negotiate or sit down at the table and do substantial negotiating. And we're hoping that the 10% to 25% is a, is a tactic saying, look, we need to negotiate before we go to 25 because 25% on this list will impact a lot more people. I love it. All right, well, thank you, Lala, for your comments. So as, as Lala was saying, in, we have finalized this list with 5,745 HTS codes or subheadings being affected. The ones that we have listed here are the assumptions. So these would not be there, but, or some of them would not be there. Um, so if you, again, if you want the list, please let us know and we will make sure that we follow up and send you the, the Excel. With this, it's, as I said, it started last week, last Monday. We're paying a 10% additional duty rate 
on products that are included in this list. And uh, starting J January 1st, we'll be paying the 25%. That's 19, 2019. 2019, right? my typo. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> All right. And drawback. Drawback is allowed for this. Now, if you notice in this slide, I did not put anything that had to do with exclusions. Why is this? Because the text uh, or the comments in the Federal Register did not have anything related to exclusions or the process for the exclusions. So that is the reason why there, as we speak, there is no exclusion process. They anticipated that they would just receive so many exclusion requests that they didn't have the manpower to uh, review them all. So instead of going that route, they, they didn't include it. So we're waiting to see what that, those comments are going to be in regards to the exclusions for list number three. So that is pending. So October the, the 9th for list number one, October December the 18th for list number two. And for list number three, we're going to have to wait and see if they add any additional comments to the Federal, uh, federal Register. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I think to be announced, and as anticipated, basically list number four is probably going to have everything, all remaining tariff codes. If list number four goes into effect, then basically every item that enters the U.S. from China will have a 25% tariff. And we're trying to, trying to understand that or, or, or look at that impact. That is why it's so important to talk strategy with, with partners like co-production and try to figure out ways to avoid that because we all know that we need all these goods, raw materials, consumer products, et cetera. But it's time to find uh, strategies and, and workarounds to work through these lists. Now, something that, that, that we requested we add on here is it, it, this might work for some people, it might not work for most, but Section 321 is basically called a de minimis value exemption. And what happens is Congress raised the limit from $250 to $800 on a de minimis import. And this Section 321 is basically, it's, it's from the Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act of 2015. What this allows is, and I think I'll give you a good example. Most of us, we order things online. Two days later, it comes to your door and nobody questions that, everybody's happy. Well, this de minimis has a lot to do with that. You order something online, the express carriers, anybody can import this and just simply import it with well, off a manifest. There's no electronic transmission and it is exempt from all duties, exempt, unless you have certain parts like that are maybe FDA related, those are exempt but most other products are allowed. So the express carriers, for, for, to use that as an example, can import these and offer manifest, clear them and deliver them to your door. By going to 800, this has completely opened up another area of opportunity. Obviously, there's a disadvantage. Uh, you, you don't need a customs broker. Uh, the US government doesn't have visibility of what's coming in under these, uh, this section called Section 321, but it, it's, it's more referred to the de minimis. So there's gotta, so, so the idea is you look for opportunities. One good example is a fulfillment center. A fulfillment center that is in China is gonna import these from China into the US if every shipment is, is consigned to one person and it's under $800, they can have a thousand shipments on one plane or on one truck coming from Mexico going to a thousand different consignees with the manifest, no electronic transmission. It's zero duty and including 301 duties. So obviously the opportunity we've talked about this with co-production, people that do fulfillment centers that are there that that's that source orders that are made online can certainly take advantage of these opportunities. And I'm sure that if you have any questions, Veronica and the CPI team will be glad to discuss those with you. And we've been working with them on a few already. So we look forward to to, to helping our clients work around some of these, some of these exemptions, some of these duty situations that, that are that are being presented. Okay, now that's a, mm -hmm. I, I like that slide under construction. Well, I think NAFTA, we can kind of put that, it's been completely revamped. The new name is now, as, as you, most of you know, the new name is now the, the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement, abbreviated USMCA, no more NAFTA. I think it's gonna take us all a while to, to, to say, you can, NAFTA, you can pronounce it, but with the new acronym USMCA, I think it's gonna be 
it's gonna be a little bit different. And but either way, it's our NAFTA 2.0. It's definitely something that has already been agreed to. Many of you know, as you know, with many of our clients and with co-production, you guys have all heard us saying for the last year and a half, NAFTA is not gonna go away. It's going to continue to be a trilateral trilateral agreement, which it is. Those of you that have continued to uh, to work towards establishing Mexico, expanding Mexico, et cetera, obviously are ahead of the curve. Most of you are, that have been waiting, the uncertainty has killed, has, has affected our industry tremendously. And for those of you that, that were waiting, well, I think the wait is over, you can move forward. For you, those of you that have been working with CPI to move forward, obviously, like I said, you're ahead. So let's continue to do that. And some of the, some of the key things, one of the most important things that everybody asks about NAFTA is, what does it look like? Well, the rough draft is available on the U.S. Trade Representative's website. We can certainly provide that link. Uh, some changes, some of the major changes are to rules of origin, especially for automotive industry. You can look at those. Claims now and, 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 and NAFTA uh, Verification. verifications, that's the word, can now be made with the NAFTA uh, Certificate of Origin Customs Form 434, or it can also be made in a free form as long as you have the minimum requirements on there so that CBP, Customs and Border Protection, can verify that the good, in fact, is NAFTA. The extension period is about the same. We have to worry about that. There's not a lot of changes. The most important thing is that all conditions as far as duties and duty exemptions continue. Zero MPF, zero merchandise processing fee on imported NAFTA goods, zero duties the way it was before. So all those exemptions are, are the same. It's curious, we're waiting to see on a local level whether uh, for those of you that are familiar with these terms, regla octava, prosex, if those exemption programs going into Mexico with raw materials are going to continue, that's still yet to be determined. Um, as we know, NAFTA is 25 years old. 25 years ago, there was a lot of sourcing that was not available in North America. Obviously, 25 years later, we've come a long way, and I'm sure that there's a lot of those raw materials can be sourced in the NAFTA territory, so we, you may see some of those exemption programs be, be done away with, especially because most of those come from China. Um, it's a 16-year it's, it's a uh, uh, agreement now. NAFTA will not have a sunset clause after five years. It's for 16 years, and it will be reevaluated every six years. And I think we all agree that that's a big win for everybody because those of you that are looking to invest or expand, it's a 16-year period rather than five years. I think most people, some people will be hesitant to invest deeply in Mexico for five years and wait to see what happens. Now you can invest knowing that in six years it'll get reevaluated. And I am certain that in six years, the reevaluations will always be in favor of the, of, the, of the trilateral countries because we're trying to protect each other from, 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 from other countries. So if, if, if you're looking at it reevaluating, I'm sure it'll benefit the, the NAFTA territory. Um, the, the, the minimum requirements for, F, for, for merchandise crossing free the minimum went up from $25.67 $25 to $26.22 for non-NAFTA uh, merchandise processing fee. And one other thing that I think is important to mention here before we move on is that in, in, for the most part with, 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 with these China tariffs, one thing that we have to consider now, before it was whether the product qualified for NAFTA or not, and that was it. And then so if it doesn't qualify for NAFTA, then we, we don't have to worry about the Chinese 301 duties. Now, another big area that I think most of you can look at is, is whether your product, even if it does not qualify for, for NAFTA, if it is assembled or made in Mexico without qualifying for NAFTA, you don't have to pay the Section 301 duties. I think that's a very important thing because the, the, we might see more assembly in Mexico where an assembled in Mexico product will not qualify for NAFTA, but will be exempt from Section 301 duties. I think that's something that you need to look closely with co-production and look at your, your, your manufacturing process and any possibilities, especially those of you that already have factories in, in, in Tijuana or Mexico or anywhere for, for, uh, in the country for that matter, where you can take advantage of those opportunities to continue to, to, to bypass these Section 301 duties. And I just want to add there, if I could, uh, there is online in the website that Lalo just mentioned for the U.S. Trade of Representatives that they have online the rules of origin. Then they're under construction, but you can take a look at them so you can 
you can get a head start and see if your HTS code, or I'm sorry, your role of origin will be affected or not. Or we can certainly provide that to you um, also if, if someone is in the need for, for that. Thank you. Yeah, you know. uh, we have a question from Nate. How do we file for 301 drawback? Okay. Okay. Oh, basically, it's the same process that you would file for a, a normal drawback, where first, normally, you would have to, the normal process is, is an intent to export a notification to customs. Once they approve it, you export the goods. Once you've exported the goods, then we submit an additional entry to CVP where we say we provide all the proof saying, oh, this item was exported, uh, please provide, please refund me the money, basically. So it's a def, a, another customs entry that we have to file for to be able to re, uh, receive But the one refund. thing, the, the drawback duties are gonna be refunded to the person that paid them. So if you were the importer and you paid the duties, those documents will be required at time of before the export. But if your vendor is paying the duties, then you need to kind of coordinate and, and, and have the vendor work with the, their customs broker to try and get those duties back because the duties will be refunded to the party that paid them. Is this a service that RL Jones does? Yes, we provide drawback services. Obviously, you know, there have been a lot less duties paid in the last 25 years because of NAFTA, but now with these trade wars, there's a lot more drawback requests being made and we're, we're working with many clients to do that now. Great. Thank you. Okay, so one more question from David. If we want to take advantage of the minimis clause, do we have to get the supplier to create individual invoices to one consignee that fall below the minimum dollar value? Well, the answer is yes and no. Yes. To cross the border, the, the trucking company in this case has to have a cargo manifest of all the consignees with the values of each item. So it doesn't have to be one invoice, a stack of invoices that the driver has, but it does need to have uh, a, a truck manifest with everything on it. It doesn't currently. It doesn't have to be transmitted electronic to customs. Customs is working on the requirement for January, where electronically they have the information has to be sent. Because right now, as we speak, trucks show up at the border with a manifest that's inches long, and they have to they they had they need to vet what's coming in, and they're having a hard time with it now. In, in, in the in the in the express environment, the the airlines. They have an electronic manifest, so it makes it easier. But on the land border, right now we're working on that. But the answer is it does have to be an invoice, but it doesn't have to be presented with the shipment at time of entry. Great. Okay. And that can only be going to the one person per day. Cannot be going to, to, to the more than one, the same person, more shipments in one day, or others you can send something to that person every day. Okay. All right. So now we kind of get into a little summary of what we've been talking about. And I think the most important one on the upper right hand side, you'll see is that right now, because of the duties that are being uh, imposed on many products, it's a very good time to reevaluate and make sure that your item is properly classified. Up until this point, everything has been duty free. So when you classify the one when it's wrong, it's NAFTA, it doesn't matter. Now, because some classifications have a 10%, some are not on the list yet, it's very important time. We, we're getting many, many calls. But, you know, one of the calls that we take, we, it's, it's funny because I say, I say reevaluate. I don't mean, oh, I have to pay duties. Well, let's change the classification. No, it doesn't work that way. And believe me, people <laughs> think it's that simple. But what we're talking about is we're talking about making sure that your item is properly classified. Throughout the years, customs amends, changes certain classifications. So your product, and obviously, especially in the electronic world, uh, there's been a lot of evolution. So a lot of times they break down classifications more. So you might find a completely different classification. I, I urge you to look, look us up and we will help you reevaluate your classifications, go through the, 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 the bill of materials, make sure that it's properly classified in case that you may fall under another classification that has less or no duty impact at all. That's until list four comes out. Until list four comes out, <laughs> we know everything's going to be on, on, on list four correct. So, and also that's a good idea. It's a good time to reevaluate that, especially with NAFTA uh, being um, a, a re restructured, where the rules of origin might change for certain items, and that might be something to look at. And obviously, if you want to request exclusions, you can do that for list one and two at this time. Make sure you do that. Um, initially, uh, most of the trade was was told save your money, don't do it, they're not giving any exclusions. 
but that has changed. There are exclusions being given. So I think if, you, if, you've, got, if you've got a good case, it's a good thing to do it. And the other thing would be section 321, as we talked about, the minimum shipments. It's a good opportunity to, if you're in a fulfillment center or you take orders online and ship from anywhere in the world, you can certainly look at this. We know that a lot of the companies here that manufacture in Mexico also have products from China that they manufacture, that, that, that they import. So you export on a daily basis manufactured goods along with, let's say, Chinese goods that were just sent to Mexico for distribution. Well, if you can coordinate that those shipments are under $800 and they're going to a single individual or a single company under $800, you can certainly avoid those, those 301 duties. And the important thing is there, that is to make sure that you send those goods into Mexico inbound because you never want to pay the duties. If you're going to be using Section 321, you definitely want to make sure that you're, that you're sending your goods into Mexico inbound or, or via Ensenada or any other Mexican port for that matter. And the other option, and I'm going to turn that over to the export here for Nearshore Solutions, it would, would be that to, to, to shift your operations. And I think Veronica, thank you. We'll let you take that over. Thank, thank you, you so much. That was amazing. I honestly, we've practiced this a couple times, and I think I learned a lot during this um, half hour discussion. So, segueing in now into nearshoring and manufacturing in Mexico. Some of you have been talking about this for some time. Some of you, this is new. So I'm gonna start from the very beginning, just to help you understand the landscape of manufacturing in Mexico and where it got started. So back in the 60s, there was a program that the US government passed, which was a Bracero program. The Bracero program allowed Mexican uh, workers to work legally in the United States to work in the, agri in the agricultural fields. Um, shortly after the Bracero program, uh, ended, a year later, the Maquiladora program was born. The intention was to allow foreign raw materials um, and export them into Mexican factories, uh, provide work for Mexican employees where they would assemble or manufacture a product for final export out of the United States. So the Maquiladora has been around for a very long time, and today we now know the Maquiladora program uh, to the permit itself is actually called the EMEX program or the EMEX permit. Um, the maquiladora is an attractive option for U.S. firms due to the low cost labor. Uh, devaluation of the peso has been one of the biggest drivers on why Mexico on a worldwide basis is very competitive. Um, and the availability of the deferring taxes on goods that are temporarily imported into Mexico. For example, today when we talked about uh, NAFTA 2.0 or, you know, whatever our new trade agreement is in, in regards to no duties when manufacturing in Mexico and a product is a Mexican product. So that's the Maquiladora program. We refer to it today as the EMEX program. And I'm going to introduce to you a little bit about the Mexican manufacturing community and how it's uh, composed in all of Mexico. So you're going to see there in the dark letters, those are all different border cities and some on the interior of Mexico. Um, in regards to total maquiladoras in Mexico, there's over 5,000 companies that are manufacturing in Mexico, um, specifically under this program. So we've been doing this for a very long time. You're going to notice that in Baja, California, we have the largest concentration of manufacturing companies in all of Mexico. Um, and then specifically the city of Tijuana with 700 manufacturing plants. Um, and the reason for that is just because of the, the logistics of where we are. And we'll get into that in just a minute. What we will find in Tijuana is we have more manufacturing plants with less employees per, per operation. So on average, our plants in Baja California and Tijuana are around 500 employees, more or less. Whereas in areas like Juarez or in Chihuahua, you'll find that there's larger operations, two, 3,000 employees per operation, but there's less of them. Just a little difference there for you. Next slide. Next, we're gonna talk about the proximity. So we're gonna focus a little bit on Southern California, not just because we're sitting today in beautiful San Diego, um, but because of the, the importance of this region when it comes to manufacturing in Mexico. So why is Tijuana such a, a big uh, location when it comes to manufacturing? Well, proximity to, the, to Los Angeles and to the ports. 
So we use the Port of Long Beach, San Diego has a port, and then we have the Port of Ensenada, which is located just two hours away from Tijuana. So three, three ports allow us to bring in goods uh, fairly easy. We then bring it into Tijuana, we manufacture it, and then export it back to the rest of the world. Next, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna jump into some of the key industries in Tijuana. The reason I'm highlighting this is just to give you a little bit of education and background on the city of Tijuana. City of Tijuana is a large city. Um, it's equally as big as San Diego. We have close to 3 million people living in the city of Tijuana. And our largest and most important industry is manufacturing. So when we're talking about the key industrial sectors, we've got four large ones, but we manufacture everything you can imagine in Tijuana. Um, and when we talk about what's where we started, we started actually in electronics. So you can see there, we have the largest number of companies in manufacturing in Tijuana are in the electronics industry, with over 120 companies manufacturing here. Um, it has the largest concentration of employees as well, with 40,000 employees. For those of you that did not know, Tijuana is actually considered the TV capital of the world. Uh, we have the Samsung cabinets, among other manufacturing facilities, uh, Ford TV, Foxconn is here, uh, Plantronics, just to name a few of the companies that we have located just 10 minutes down the street from where we are today. Uh, next, we have the automotive company. We have the famous Toyota truck. We're manufacturing that here. Um, and then we've got the medical device industry. That's a very industri uh, interesting industry that's been on the rise. It's aggressively catching up to the electronics industry, although we don't have the largest number of concentration. We have four, about 44 plus companies. We have almost close to 42,000 employees in that industry. Uh, an interesting fact for you is if you were to evaluate the top 10 medical device companies in the world, seven of them have a factory in Tijuana. So that goes to show the importance of Tijuana when it comes to medical manufacturing. And then we have aerospace. Aerospace has been around for a very long time. We have over 37 employees and 11,000 employees here with the famous Icon aircraft uh, operation that we opened up about two, two years, almost three years ago now. So next we're gonna talk about why Mexico. Of course, um, labor, has something to do with it. Uh, we've been talking to many companies who are manufacturing in China just in the last week, and we're finding that Mexico is very competitive when it comes to its labor rate. So we have over, right now, our average labor cost, fully burdened, is about $2.50 an hour. That's for an entry-level type of assembler who's working in a manufacturing environment. Um, some interesting facts about the border region when it comes to labor is that we're not just, um, this is a bicultural, bilingual uh, border. It's very fluid, meaning that people who live in Mexico are learning how to speak English, not because they learned it at their Mexican schools, but they're learning it from the TV and radio waves. So what you're gonna find is that the Mexican worker not only can speak English, not all the time, but a lot of time, um, and they learned it from watching TV or listening to the radio, but they understand our way of life. They understand our politics. They understand what's going on with the Chargers, at least in San Diego. <laughs> um, so they're very much in tune with, um, with our way of life, as we are. So, for example, as you know, San Diegans, we cross into Mexico three, four times a week as Mexican uh, employees are coming over here to buy their groceries and uh, put gas in their cars. So it's a very fluid border where there's a lot of crossing back and forth. Uh, another interesting point about the, the workforce here is the uh, output. So in Mexico, for those of you who are not aware, it's a 40-hour work week as opposed to the U.S. 40-hour work week. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about... One yep. question oh, we before question. we jump into the next sure. slide. Um, a question from Nate. We had heard that they were going to increase the minimum wage for labor to export to the USA. Is there any truth to that? We are expecting some increases, and I'll be perfectly honest, my feeling is that this is a good thing. Um, wages have been stagnant. I've been in this business for about 18 years now, and that 250 was about 225 18 years ago. 
And the truth is, is that there needs to be some increases when it comes to the wages in Mexico. In regards to anybody who's working with, with us in regards to their feasibility studies, we've accounted for those increases in the wages. Um, so our philosophy is making sure that our customers are prepared for those increases. And although there's going to be a bit of an increase, I don't think it's going to impact the way that we're seeing China increasing their wages as aggressively as they are. Great question, thank you. So next, we're gonna talk a little bit about the labor cost comparison. So this is a great model for anybody who's in the United States um, and is looking to just get some quick numbers in regards to comparison between US and Mexico. So this model here will show you an operation with 100 employees on both sides of the border. Um, we posted there a $2.50 hourly rate versus an $18 rate. Uh, both are fully burdened in the US. Uh, we're just comparing labor here. Uh, we put in the differences in the hours per week, and then we come up with about a $3 million savings just on labor alone. So that's a pretty big impact. And now we're gonna talk about a solution. We could spend the next three hours talking about the various options that you have, contract manufacturing in Mexico, or opening up on your own. Um, but many of you have reached out because we need to do something quick. Um, and so we're gonna talk about specifically about the shelter program. So the shelter program is a program that has been around just as long as the uh, maquiladora program has existed. And essentially what it is, is um, we have existing Mexican entities that are permitted and certified, ready to start an operation as quickly <clears throat> as 60 to 90 days. Um, typically, the largest lead time is in the tenant improvements for any of the manufacturing facilities. Um, so when we're talking about what a shelter does is we provide all of the administrative services to get you started quickly in Mexico. We find the facility for you. We find the, all of the legal documents in Mexico. We hire all of the employees, handle all of the recruitment. We, hand, we manage that legal entity. We own it and operate it on our client's behalf um, and essentially we provide all of the international trade and compliance, all the legal framework, all of the accounting, we do all of the taxes in Mexico, all of the environmental health and safety, and all of the HR recruitment and payroll processing. So we handle all of those complex things that most people don't want to do anyways, allowing our customers to focus strictly on production. So our customers then provide the technical know-how, direction on the production process, capital equipment, and raw materials. And essentially, we have a factory. So I can give you an example of a, of a facility that we're putting together, 400 employees. Uh, we signed a contract with them in September, and we will have them in production in November. That's not always the case, so don't mind <laughs> expecting the same results. Um, but those are um, cases where if, if all the stars line up, then we can have factories put together that quickly. That on average, I can tell you can take anywhere from six to nine months. Again, the complexity of the tenant improvements for your facility is really the most important uh, part in regards to time frame. So I think that covers it. That's uh, a little bit about the shelter program. Um, you know, you've heard that for over the last 40 years, we've navigated through international trade policy. We've talked about tax reforms, uh, binational agreements. None of them have uh, weaken this industry. It's only strengthened. This was a big win for us this week. We're really excited about what we hear um, in regards to the future of international trade. And we welcome you to come join us so that you can learn more about manufacturing and see it for yourself. So in November on, uh, what do we have? November 1st, we will be having a Baja manufacturing tour where we invite you to go visit some of our clients' facilities, talk to some of our, our clients directly, um, kind of kick the tires and see if this is a right fit for your company. Daria will be there to talk more about NAFTA and give some updates on that. And then we will treat you to a beautiful Baja Med uh, cuisine with some amazing wines if you haven't heard about that. Okay. <laughs> so um, at this point, we're going to turn it over to if there's any additional questions on manufacturing in Mexico on anything that Daria or Lalo had to say. This is the time. Please. Type in your questions and we're happy to answer 
any of the specific questions that you have in regards to any of the subjects that we talked about today. Okay, we have a question for, from Kate. In light of all the changes with USMCA and new US tariffs, are customs and import export support included in shelter services? Um, so I'm sorry, repeat that again. Okay, so in light of all the changes uh, with NAFTA and all the new tariffs that are being imposed, are customs and import export uh, support included in the shelter oh, services? Oh, of course, of course. So co-production has an entire international trade and compliance team. Um, and we work both with R.L. Jones on the U.S. side, we work with Mexican brokers, and all three team of people, if I were to tell you the quantity of people that are working on, on these tasks, making sure that our clients are protected, you would be amazed. It's probably over 100 people who are touching every single one of these clients and making sure that they're prepared for the, all of the international training compliance. And just, just to add to that, Veronica, it, it, with, with co-production under clients, we work very closely directly with them. Things are starting to change. Once they're set up and established, we have a direct communication with them to make sure that they're that they're compliant, that they know all the opportunities that are that are coming up as we speak. So yes, there's a lot of consulting and a lot of uh, work together with co-production. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question: What are the tariffs like from China to Mexico? Oh, that's a broad question. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's in, in the world we're talking about right now. Most of most of what you're talking about through the EMEX program, obviously, is pretty much duty free raw materials going as long as they come out within 18 months. There are no tariffs. If you want to sell Chinese products into Mexico and pay the duties, you really have to consult that with a Mexican broker who will give you break down those tariffs. But in the, in, in the scope of everything we're talking about here, manufacturing in Mexico, and then bring it back out, there are no duties. Now, if you have certain raw materials or certain items that you produce in Mexico, and, and you're in the temporary import program, and then you wanna change the status to permanent, then you would have to talk to that Mexican broker and pay those duties at that time, but not a time of entry in the, in the EMEX program. So the key when it comes to that is basically transformation, right? When we're talking about making a, a, bringing things from China, bringing it into Mexico, think transformation. You have to transform it and it has to become a product. And then we're talking and, 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 I, and I would think that it, you'd be pretty safe because the way, the way co-production works and the way the industry works basically is you bring in what you need. It's a very lean environment. It's a just-in-time environment. So raw materials that come in, are consumed and exported, scrap is dealt with accordingly, there's no duty implications there, and you can re-export the raw materials that you don't need, and, and, and we can either find ways to, to import those uh, with the special programs, or but, but for the most part, you, you'll find that your consumption will, will use up your raw materials. Okay. All right, anything else you speakers would like to add to the conversation? Mm -hmm. um, all our there. participants, don't be shy. Uh, there's a Q&A box on your Zoom settings where you can add your questions or you can send them later uh, via email or, or through our website. Great, so thank I wanna thank Garian and, and Lalo for participating on this panel. I think it was wonderful. Thank no, you thank you very us. much for having us. Uh, great team to work with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, uh, thank you everyone. We appreciate your being here. If you would like to get the three full lists of the HTS codes impacted by the new tariffs in Excel format, please send me an email and I will get them to you soon. Also, don't forget to register for our upcoming tour. It's truly a great experience and a good opportunity to see Mexico manufacturing firsthand. Thank you for joining us today and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.